Hello, happy holidays. Um, let's get through this as efficiently as possible. I'm here in the Google Drive. If you're the winner assignment, you can see the lecture. I'm going to start with the 15 lecture and go to the 17 lecture. So we're talking te temperature, heat, and expansion. Um, we're previewing thermodynamics here because whenever you get back, as we're jumping into, you should have learned a lot of this stuff in chemistry class. So I understand that you may not remember all of these topics. Temperature, I guess the everyday definition responds to the warmth or coldness of an object. It's not a great definition. We're going to update that. Um, it does have a lower limit, but there is no upper limit. The reason that is because we're talking about energy. So you can have zero energy. We can run out of energy, but there is no such thing as infinite energy, so we can keep going up, up, and up, and up. Uh, now, because there is a finite amount of energy in the universe, I guess there really is an upper limit, but it's not defined by um, temperature. So, this definition that we're working off of is proportional to the average translational kinetic energy. So, if we define those words, um, average means that if we're looking at the temperature of a glass of water, we're going to average out all the molecules of water in there. Translational refers to the kind of movement that we're talking about. It's moving back and forth. Um, means we're not just talking about linear, linear motion. Kinetic energy means we're talking about um, motion, not potential energies. So gas particles are bouncing around. Liquid particles are sliding across each other and solid particles have this uh, vibration. So the way a thermometer works, we use thermometers to uh, measure temperature, but the modern thermometer that uses uh, mercury in it uh, works by expansion and contraction because the, the density of substances is dependent on temperature. So since the mass isn't changing, the volume changes. So as it gets hotter, it expands. As it gets cooler, it contracts. That's going to be a property we're going to see um, more about. There's also these fancy infrared thermometers. Uh, these kind of infrared radiation. We're going to talk about that more in the unit after thermodynamics. So uh, the Celsius scale, which is what the modern world uses. Uh, I say the modern world because it doesn't include the United States for reasons that don't make any sense to anyone. Uh, Anders Celsius invented the scale. Um, and, you know, whenever... Whenever um, these scales are first coming out, they were made by people who thought, um, thought they could sell thermometers. So when Fahrenheit made his scale, he made the zero point as about as cold as you see it on any given day, and 100 degrees is about as hot as you see it on any given day. That's why the water points end up being so weird, because Fahrenheit didn't base the scale on water. He based it on atmosphere, of where he lived. Celsius aligned it with the water, and then Kelvin, Kelvin moved it from... Um, Maybe it's so we can do math with it better. Because the problem with Celsius when we want to do math is that the same problem with Fahrenheit is that if it's 100 degrees, that's not twice as hot as 50 degrees. Whenever we realize that hot refers to temperature. Then Kelvin, though, Kelvin makes zero the bottom. In Kelvin, there are no negative numbers. So our math works out nicely in Kelvin. Um, each degree is the same size as a Celsius, but when we move it all the way down, you know, 5 Kelvin is really half as much energy as 10 Kelvin, because 0 Kelvin is the bottom. That doesn't work with Celsius, because, you know, is negative 5 Celsius negative 2 times as much as positive 10 Celsius, this doesn't make any sense, because negative works there. So, 
whenever we refer to heat, we're actually talking about the transfer of energy flowing from one thing to another. And the direction is important. We always go from um, high energies to low energies as the direction of flow. We measure it in joules and we measure it in calories, just depend on the scale. We define it by water. We like to define things by water. Um, a calorie is the amount of energy it takes to change one gram of water by one degree Celsius. That much energy is one calorie. And the conversion is 4.18 joules. Now, because things were confusing enough, um, the calorie we use in food is a capital C calorie, which is actually a kilocalorie. Um, in other countries, you'll see them called kcal, kilocalories. Um, they'll actually, they don't write this capital C calorie. I guess, I guess I figured Americans couldn't figure out what a kilocalorie was. So they just capitalized it. So a capital C calorie is a thousand lowercase c calories. The lowercase c calorie is the real unit. One lowercase c calorie is the heat needed to change one gram of water by a degree Celsius. Um, the capital C calorie is crazy, but I'm not going to try to use it in physics. Uh, if we wanted to use the capital C calorie, we'll just say kilocalorie. New pauses to read it. Just the proportionality there. So, specific heat refers to that it takes different amount of energy to change different amounts of substances. By different, it, you'll get different heat changes depending on what the uh, the material is. So the specific heat capacity is how much energy you're going to transfer into the system to change its temperature by one degree. Um, water has an extremely high specific heat capacity. It's one of the things that makes it useful in a lot of industrial applications. Um, other things like metals have very low specific heat capacities. They change temperature very quickly. has a lot to do with climate. It's why um, why in deserts you get really high highs and really low lows um, because the temperature can change you know very easily. In places where you have a lot of water and a lot of moisture you know it doesn't get as hot during the summer but it also doesn't get as cold during the winter because the amount of energy that can be stored in the water. Thermal expansion, uh, we mentioned with the thermometers. Um, I mean, this is a pretty good rule of thumb for like 99% of substances. They expand when heated and contract when cooled. You can think of it in terms of motion. If we have all these molecules bouncing around, the faster they're moving, they bounce into each other more. And if they have a higher temperature, meaning a higher average kinetic energy, then they'll bounce apart farther meaning they expand out. You can see how it's messed with that railroad there. Um, that's, that's the same reason why sidewalks are made in those little squares, little gaps, having just one continuous drip of concrete. I mean, they poured it, they could have poured it, you know, all the way across, but that doesn't leave any room for expansion. You know, water, water does a little bit of a weird thing. Um, let's see, do we have a graph here? Yeah, we do. Um, I'll put it here so you can pause it for a second. I'm going to use this graph, though. You see, between 0 and 4 degrees Celsius, water does some interesting things. It's because of its crystalline structure. Because of its polar nature, water will rearrange itself so that the negative oxygen side will align with the positive hydrogen side. Remember that from chemistry? that causes it to actually take up more space even though it's getting colder 
as the molecules start to rotate and align in the right shape, as crystallization is starting to become a real option. Um, other than that, water will behave normally, but in that spot right there, uh, you know, that, that interesting thing happens. It gives us a lot of interesting properties of water, but it's all to do with crystallization, crystal structure. The, think about how terrible it would be if ice didn't float. You know, most of the time the solid is more dense than the liquid, but ice is an exception because of because it's crystal structure. But if you think about a lake, if the top surface of the lake began to freeze and then those crystals sink, then the top surface would be exposed to the cold air again, so it would freeze, and then those crystals would sink. And eventually, all the water would be exposed to the air as all the ice kept sinking to the bottom, and the lake would freeze solid. Because water, when it freezes to ice, is less dense, the ice floats. And so you get a layer of ice that separates the water from the colder air and acts as an insulator, which prevents the um, water from freezing any further. So that layer of ice actually, you know, preserves the integrity of life in the lake. Alright, jump over to 17. So, you know, we've talked a lot about liquid gases, uh, solids. We haven't talked a lot about plasmas. Um, plasmas just happen whenever we get a high enough energy if the electrons are no longer bound to the nucleus. That's all plasma is. Um, you no longer have electron structures. The, we don't see plasmas super often because they're such a high temperature. Um, Rather, we, we do see them, just in very small, very small amounts. So, from liquid to gas, we have evaporation and condensation. Now, we reach an equilibrium here, because even, even as we have a sealed container, say, say a, a sealed bottle of water, okay, we have a bottle of water, it's closed. We're constantly getting some evaporation that the um, the water in the bottle is evaporating that little space of air inside the bottle, but then some of the water in the air is condensing into the liquid. It's just that once we reach equilibrium, for every molecule that evaporates up, another molecule condenses down, and so we end up with a constant amount. Um, even you know when you have a pot of water boiling on the stove you know for every hundred molecules that evaporate you might get another molecule that condenses so you always have both directions the question is which one's going to be faster so you get that net effect you know it's kind of interesting i said the word boiling that we have two words evaporation and boiling for moving from um from liquid to gas from water to water vapor. Um, the only difference that's really to do with pressure. In evaporation, you're going from um, air that has a high pressure, where the atmospheric pressure exceeds the vapor pressure, the pressure of the water getting out. In boiling, the vapor pressure exceeds the atmospheric pressure, and the water is pushing itself out of the faster rate. It's essentially the same process, just different in pressures. Now, evaporation also gives us a net cooling effect, because the most energetic molecules in the liquid are the ones that are most likely to escape. So, if your fastest moving molecules, if you lose the fastest ones, then the average molecule left in the water is now lower. 
because we still have all the low ones, we just don't have the high ones to average in anymore. So as water evaporates, the water that's left behind becomes cooler and cooler. Uh, it's the reason that sweating works. Sublimation is a word that you might have lost from vocabulary just because it's not frequent. Um, it's when we go straight from solid to gas. You know, it's, it's like those times like when we, we actually get a little bit of snow on the ground and the snow is gone, but we don't have huge puddles everywhere. The snow just starts to disappear. That's a form of sublimation. So condensation is uh, exactly the opposite of evaporation. And, you know, it really helps to think about this in terms of um, intermolecular forces. Think about how the water interacts with other waters. In the water vapor phase, we have very weak intermolecular attractions. My water molecules are far apart, they're separate, they're not near each other. Uh, but whenever we're a liquid, my water molecules have gotten so close that they're sticking to each other. Um, you know, the positive hydrogens to the negative oxygens. And it's that intermolecular, intermolecular attraction that really, really binds them together. So when, whenever we have condensation, uh, we actually increase the temperature because all that kinetic energy is getting absorbed into the liquid. So, um, so you're getting that, that energy transfer, which we use as temperature. Yeah, we talked about this a little bit. So different different altitudes, you have a different amount of atmosphere above you, different amount of atmospheric pressure. Um, so we get your boiling point depends on your atmospheric pressure, which means it depends on your altitude, um, which makes cooking times really frustrating. So whenever we have a solid, that means that we have a really strong intermolecular force between those atoms. They are bonded and attracted to each other so tightly that it would take energy and force to separate them. So what happens whenever we melt them is we get the molecules vibrating faster and faster and faster. And we're heating it up. That's what temperature means, how fast they're vibrating. And eventually they'll vibrate so fast that they're moving quickly enough with enough energy that they can break away whatever attraction was keeping them together. Now, if they melt into a liquid, there's still some attraction, so they can't completely separate from each other, but, you know, they were bound together as a solid. As a solid, they could kind of wiggle back and forth. These are kind of my two molecules. They could wiggle back and forth, but they couldn't leave. If they melt into a liquid, now they're moving fast enough that they can at least slide past each other and move, but they still have some attraction to each other they can't separate. If they had tons of energy, uh, say enough to be a gas, they'd have enough energy that they could vibrate and actually separate from each other, from whatever attraction bonded those two molecules are together. Freezing, of course, being the opposite. So, Energy is what's critical to think of here. You have to think of everything in terms of energy. We're going from solid, liquid, to gas, to plasma. Energy is being absorbed into the material. In the reverse direction, energy is being released. But the energy always has to go somewhere. We have to follow the energy. Now, that amount of energy can be... Um, 
predicted. It's um, consistent. So when we talk about the specific heat capacity, we talk about how much energy it would take to change the temperature of it. Well, we can also talk about how much energy it takes to change the phase of it. So for example, the heat of fusion for water is 334 joules per gram. That's how much energy we need for every gram to make that transition. So um, fusions for solid to liquid, vaporizations from liquid to gas. Uh, the direction doesn't matter in terms of how big the number is. It's just a matter of is it positive or negative. Do, is that how much energy we're going to get out or is that how many we have to put in? Think about the energy flow. Um, notice the heat of vaporization for water is much higher than the heat of fusion for water. The heat of fusion is 334 joules per gram, but it takes a lot more energy to change the liquid to a gas than it did to change the solid to a liquid. Now, I have to make an important point here that this doesn't actually change the temperature. So if we're talking in terms of Celsius, the at one atmosphere, standard atmosphere and pressure, um, the boiling point of water should be 100 degrees Celsius by definition, so we define 100 degrees Celsius as. Well, 100 degrees Celsius is, we could see liquid water or we could see gaseous water, um, water vapor. So, you know, just like at zero degrees Celsius, we could have zero degrees ice or we could have zero degrees water. That um, energy is just to make the conversion. It doesn't actually change the temperature. So you'd have to go through this heat of vaporization right here to go from 100 degrees liquid water. If you had one gram of 100 degrees Celsius liquid water and you put 2,256 joules of energy, you don't have one gram of 100 degrees Celsius gaseous water. And then you'd have to use the specific heat capacity to change the temperature. All right. Um, I hope these really felt pretty straightforward to you. They're meant to be a review. If you look back in the Google Drive here, uh, there are some quicker questions. Chapter 15, you can use these for your studying. Uh, so you can kind of look at the slide, you can look at the question, the next slide has the answer. Okay, there's a fair amount of questions there. Um, there's also here from Chapter 17. Now, these questions are meant to be review questions. Um, they're very low level. They're not supposed to be indicative of what would be on the exam. Um, obviously, they'd be at a much higher level. Um, but use these to help review and help to go through and just to kind of make sure that you got the outline of the lecture. There's the UT Quest assignments up that's meant to help you with that a little bit more. And then your study groups really be solidifying. The point of your study groups is not to go and touch on the smallest um, you know, most low level information. One of the study groups is help you push forward and get the highest level information to condense all your facts together and make sure that they're working together in a cohesive fashion so that your knowledge is like a web instead of a list. And we'll talk about that. Okay, um, happy holidays. I hope that helped you review the chapter and put some things into context. There's some math to practice here, but you know, with the specific heat capacity and the heats of fusion and vaporization, but it's pretty straightforward. Um, sometimes it's multi-step, so make sure you're showing your work. And make sure you're keeping things organized. Um, other than that, I'll see you in January.